Coming to our session, we're going to talk about authoring experience. My name is Brian Olendike, uh, BTO Pro. Um, I work at Penn State College of Arts and Architecture, Office of Digital Learning. It's a mouthful. All right. And I'm headless. And he's headless. There we go. <laughs> I'm Mike Potter. I work, also work for the Office of Digital Learning in a different college, a really college of science. All right, and I'm Zane Sensenig. I work at uh, Smeal College of Business at Penn State, and I also work in e-learning. So um, we're all here to talk about what we think is something really awesome, but before those two show you, I'm going to sort of set the stage by talking about um, authoring experience, which is sort of like an overarching theme for the, uh, the software. So let's talk about what authoring experience is. And so for me, at the like very basic level, it's empathy for the builders and also empathy for the end users. Um, so another way to put this is if you're like a front end person, I would say that authoring experience is like UX for the Drupal admin. So we're looking at moving away from the traditional WYSIWYG block. So for me, that's what, what authoring experience is. And the idea is that if you empower builders who are ultimately using your Drupal sites, then the end user experience is going to be inherently better. Right, so that's an overview of what authoring or AX is. So what what is Drupal's authoring problem? Well, so I started down the authoring experience trail about two years ago when I was working at um, another unit at Penn State. And I noticed that we had a huge problem where it was um, we had content contributors who were interested in simply putting a page out to the world that had two columns, right? But in our traditional architecture, it was just a WYSIWYG block. So to make that happen, it was kind of, kind of a challenge. So I started looking at solutions, and I found this uh, paragraphs module. I built, uh, or I, I did a video on it, and it randomly has like 9,000 views. So if you want to check it out, that's, that's what I did. Um, right, but so here's an example of how I integrated paragraphs. So you can see this is a basic web page. It has sort of two columns. And you can see on the back end, that's what it looks like in a paragraph. So has everyone seen this before? Paragraphs module or anything like it? OK. So, so that's what it looks like, right? It's kind of like drag and drop, but not really a seamless experience. Um, another example of this is uh, field collection. All right, so we're talking about traditional AX paradigms in Drupal, right? So another one is field collection. Another one is WYSIWYG, which I've talked about. Also panels. And is this a problem? Yeah, it's a problem, right? So every year... Uh, at DrupalCon, there's a talk called Battle of the Body Field, and I feel like if we're, if we're trying to build seamless AX solutions, that shouldn't really even be a talk, right? And then another example is if you want to integrate MathJax and you Google MathJax, a lot of the, the results you get are like MathJax plugins for WordPress, Chrome Store, Drupal, you name it. So point that I'm making is we're putting a lot of stress on the front end by using Drupal as the vehicle that drives the front end. So we think that Drupal should be used as it's intended, which is the, to be a very powerful back end. And um, hopefully, after this talk, you'll uh, have an opportunity to try the new paradigm. So I'm going to bring it over to Brian. And I'm going to sit down because I'm too tall to lean over this thing. All right, so does so anyone know what uniform components are or component architecture, just high level? Like Pattern Lab? Sure, like Pattern Lab. Right, that's an excellent example, all right? So Pattern Lab really taking off in Drupal, which, does you want to say what Pattern Lab is? Definition? A quick person Static yell Pattern Lab. generator that spits out your style guide. Style, yeah, so you sort of get style guide dictate. It's kind of like design and design assets are dictating to the back end, right? So we like that, that direction of the data flow, right? So these things is what we'll be talking about then, right? Uh, Vue, AngularJS, and React. Um, no, we don't need a framework. Those are frameworks. 
<laughs> we heard you say you do not need a framework because the web is the platform. And then a little headless guy. Wait, <laughs> what is the platform? The web is the platform. Does anyone know what this specification is? Hint, it's web components. It's web components. So web components is this unfortunate phrase that you go like, oh, you mean component architecture? Y yes, but it's actually a spec of the browser. And you can go and read it, and it's, it's a meta specification that if the browser supports these four concepts of a templating engine, custom elements, shadow DOM, and a way of importing an asset, that technically that browser supports what is known as web components. And so it's a meta specification. Um, this infographic is from webcomponents.org, which is expressing the stability in each platform of this versus, hey, you need a polyfill to use it. And as you can see, there's green lights all the way across, which means you can get total browser coverage with this technology using polyfills. And it's native in Chrome and Opera and almost completely native in Safari. So we're going to use a uvase, which is a phrase I just came up with because I had the letters. And it's understanding via a uh, silly example, as we all know. Right, so you can effectively with web components, you're making a custom HTML tag. Right, so instead of us going into template files and building div, 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 all those divs mean something semantically, right? What if we can make a tag that encapsulated div, 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 and then we just put that tag down? Right now we have a by reference to a single asset. We can update the whatever that's called. In this case, it's awesome explosion. So I had to make a silly one for the U base. And so awesome hyphen explosion was how do I get an explosion on the web page? Explosion obviously is not that hard. I, I find IMG SRC equals whatever. I find a GIF, I put it in the field. That whole process I just described is impossible for any other human being on earth that doesn't understand even how to copy and paste, let alone what a GIF is or what IMG SRC tags are. Okay? But I could technically tell someone, well, I just want an awesome explosion there. Awesome. Get an awesome explosion tag, copy paste. You know, granted, there's still a copy paste barrier. But that then that would go, this is what an awesome explosion is. Wouldn't it be great if the web just knew that? So it would look like this. It would be awesome explosion, and it would unpack it, and I have it. And then wouldn't it be great if I could kind of program that awesome explosion, and I could say, I want you to be tiny or small or big or epic. Right now, that's class structure out the wazoo and dot epic and dot size hyphen epic and let's use BAM and SAS and all this stuff to basically just get an image to be the right size. Right? Uh, what if we could change the color? Uh, I'm sure every user on Earth is going to understand that I, you know you should just use some opacity and, and, and filtering. No, I don't even know frickin' CSS to do accomplish what this just did. But if we wanted to make a big, red, awesome explosion, I should be able to write one damn tag and the whole thing just happens. Does anyone think that's possible? No, the answer is yes, of course, because it's right there. So, <laughs> so this is our awesome hyphen explosion tag. If you go on webcomponents.org, you can search for awesome hyphen, just awesome. I mean, how many awesome things could there possibly be? But there's awesome hyphen explosion, and this will come up. So I'm going to step through what a web component looks like to the developer here real quick. So we've got down the right side, you've got your five parts of the spec. And now, so the first thing we're going to do is to see that this is the, I'm not going to point to a stinking image that small gang, okay? See? So we zoom in, right? So the top of that file is going to have a method of importing a reference to another file. So much like normal HTML where I put a div and a div and a paragraph and a span, I can do that with custom elements. But I need to teach the browser what the heck the definition of that custom element is. So to do that, the top of each file I'm going to import by referencing that other file. So this is the import aspect of the spec. But HTML can pull in other HTML assets. There, the reason there's two things here instead of one is there's at the moment a bit of a disagreement about do we import these as HTML or do we pull these in as script type modules which is JavaScript which is more more popular in like a React worldview but that's not a big deal it sounds like it's a big deal it's actually very minimal so the next part is template engine that's that the browser can support this tag it's a native HTML tag called template and anything in a template tag your browser goes oh no I got you that's there but it doesn't render it it doesn't process it until that template tag is told to stamp its content. So you can actually take a template tag, put it in the DOM, use JavaScript and say dot to content against that template tag, and it'll take its content and stamp it into the DOM. 
so that you can do that over and over and over again so that we get reusability of whatever is inside of that thing. Then there's custom element and shadow DOM. So this is the CSS <coughs> structure of my tag. I can actually say colon host, if the size property is, or attribute is epic, then the image I want you to make size 45. This is, and the shadow DOM aspect is that this is all scoped within the element. I'm not writing global CSS anymore. I'm writing CSS that will only ever influence the thing below it, which is the awesome explosion. The outside world is not coming in and making the awesome explosion. Well, now it has a border on it because you use the Drupal module that imported the JavaScript library that pulled in the thing to do the jQuery that occasionally puts it on that ice. You get out of all of that. So what else does this look like? Well, it looks like normal HTML. In my tag, I'm just writing CSS, and then I'm referencing an IMG tag. And now this gets into a little bit of weeds of as far as Polymer versus other things. Polymer is a way of producing web components. There's web components is your spec. You'll see this logo pop up a bunch if you start <coughs> Googling web components. Uh, Google just happened to be doing it way before anyone else was, and they made this thing called Polymer to make it. You don't have to use Polymer to make them. We do, though. You know, we'll kind of talk about why. Uh, but basically, I can now, in my custom element I've made, I can say whatever they said the image is, put that here. Right, so in this awesome explosion example, people can actually override what the image is to be a different one, theoretically. Uh, I can then have event listeners on this to say when someone taps on it, play a sound, and I don't have that in here because it is incredibly annoying, especially with a recording, to have what sounds like a car bomb going off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then the custom element aspect. So imagine you're actually defining a visual asset API. This is effectively the API of how to talk to the awesome explosion. So we've said the awesome explosion has a state, which is that it's stopped. And then I can use that state value to toggle whether or not the audio is playing. But it's all internally scoped to that element. That JavaScript is not going to influence things outside of my element. Uh, same with if it's stopped or if it's currently playing. And then I can wire that to functions, right, and all of my you know, this dot whatever, is, everything is scoped, again, within this single thing that I'm working on. And then I can use these and other things, and they're all scoped to the single thing they're working on. So this is almost like containerization on the front end. You've got all these little Lego bricks that you're slowly building up and reusing it everything else over and over and over and over again. So why web components? Because what I just said is ridiculously awesome. If I make a card and I say, client A has this baseball card, I can use the client hyphen A hyphen baseball card over and over and over again across other projects. And they're scoped. So they'll play nice with everything else going on in the universe. And if they use a button, and that button is deemed inaccessible, I know the file to go edit to update that button. And that button now, accessibility changes are propagated everywhere. So I have a canonical source for a visual asset. I'm not worried about the back end and how it gets there. So I have component uniformity. I can work across libraries, right? I can write assets, not, I'm not writing visual assets for Pattern Lab or for Drupal or for any, I'm writing them for the web as a platform itself as if the web knew what that tag was and then I'm leveraging those across any platform. Uh, also accessibility, there's a lot of accessibility baked into components that already exist. There's also a lot of really good conventions associated with but also just tracking and going like you know, all of our links, we're not going to use A tags. In everything we do, we are going to use a A hyphen link tag. And that A hyphen link tag is going to ensure that it's underlined at all times and it's scoped so no one could ever influence our A, right? That becomes an accessibility consideration. Now you can't make it inaccessible. So this allows us to attack projects across development spaces. And I put WordPress all the way at the end because it's evil and I want it to go away. But I can currently write a visual asset for Drupal 6, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, Grab CMS, and Backdrop simultaneously. Does that sound like it might be interesting or useful? Or even a desktop app, which John told me you're going out of style. But this allows us, via, via Electron, we can now simultaneously build a desktop application and a website using the exact same assets, because this will work anywhere. So what can we build now? And now we're going to go to Potter. It literally, you didn't even take out the Potter stuff here slide. Uh, no, no, no. This is my stuff here. This is my demo. So 
Potter's going to perfectly describe this. As he gets on my computer here, so we're going to walk through. So this is how you can display. This is how you can find your, where your mouse is and use Alfred and pull up displays. And this is how we can mirror what's on here to here. Let's see, it's over here now. It's a problem when you have to switch to the place. It is. There you go, buddy. And, and we apologize, but <laughs> this is probably easier. Okay. It's also uh, at DrupalCon right before our presentation. I went, Brian, look at this slide, and I punched my computer, and it fell on the floor. So this half the screen uh, is gone. So <laughs> that's why you get this. You can actually see it up there. there. All right, so uh, Pattern Lab. Anyone using Pattern Lab now? If you're not, you should, you should definitely start thinking about your front end design in this way. There's Pattern Lab. Boss about it at 415. OK, there, there you go. go. Um, so it's, it's all about uh, teaching the right component architecture. So this is, what this, this is where a lot of things are going, where you boil things down and you containerize them. You try to think of things as Legos. You try to design things at the smallest point and build off from there. That way you can reuse them. Um, the problem with Pattern Lab is that these are just design components. They don't, they're, they're not really intelligent. They can't really communicate with each other, right? So what web components do is take this principle, but give your components an API so that they can communicate with each other. So this is webcomponents.org. They've got a, a ton of web components on there. And we're going to use that. We're going to leverage that to build um, a little... A little tutorial site. So this is, if you download uh, Contenta and install it, um, it has, it's just, Contenta is a Drupal 8 REST slash GraphQL out of the box. Uh, pretty neat, we just started playing with it. But um, you can uh, download it and install it and you have your, uh, your REST endpoints uh, ready to go. So what we have here is a headless application. Woohoo! See, it's that easy. So if we take a look at how we're actually getting this content, this is my web component. This is VR app root. So if I look at what my front end application looks like in index.html, it's one tag. That's it. And I will try to, if you can't see it, uh, just give me a shout and I'll try to fix it. Okay, so it's one tag that's delivering this whole thing. Inside of that tag, is this thing Iron Ajax. So this is what's going out and grabbing the data. So I didn't have to write JavaScript to say, query this endpoint, bring it back, and I'll assign it to a variable. It's doing that for me. That's a web component? That's a web component. So what we did was say, well, I don't want to write JavaScript if I don't have to. So I'm going to type in Iron Ajax. Here we go. Here's the tag. Here is an example of how you use it. Here are all the properties you have access to. Here are all the methods that are on there. Here are the events that are happening in there that you can tap into. So just for going and making a call, look at this documentation here. So this is one little Lego brick inside of this application that you can reuse. So I pointed it to my back end here. And I said, whatever, go get everything at this URL and assign it to this response. And I'm just looping over that response and printing this nice list. Which I mentioned data binding. Uh, OK, so what we're doing is if, you, if you're familiar with working with any of the front end frameworks, uh, this is what's known as data binding. So you're assigning, dynamically assigning uh, values to properties. And you can use those properties throughout your template. So you can stamp down, based on your, uh, the structure of your data, you can start stamping down uh, actual templates. So. Uh, in this case, an unordered list. So if we look in here. This is actually what it's stamping down here. So this is, the, what you're seeing here is, this is why we use Polymer. Because Polymer <coughs> takes care of like the data binding. Same thing with React, same thing with Angular, same thing with Vue. They all do the same thing. Which, this, the curly braces is a two-way data binding. 
versus these are one-way data bound. So in the case of Iron Ajax, that call is going to go out and that internal to that tag, you don't care how it handles it. You care that it gets your data to this response object. So then if you define response <coughs> in your tag, now that Iron Ajax tag has gotten the stuff and said, here it is, <coughs> unpacks as JSON and you just have it as an object locally. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool. So bam, we have headless, uh, headless application. Um, so I was also stumbling uh, through Contenta here and I found GraphQL. If, has anyone been looking at GraphQL or using it? Uh, it's pretty dope. Uh, so I just did like a quick tutorial and uh, it walked me through setting up this query and I'm like, oh, to look at all this stuff I have access to. So this is stuff that traditionally with a REST application it'd be difficult to get to. Okay, cool, I want to start using GraphQL. How do I do it? Do I go and start researching everything about GraphQL? Oh no, I just go to webcomponents.org. Type in uh, GraphQL. Hey look, someone wrote a plugin for it. How do I implement it? Okay, two tags. Okay, so I'll do that. And I'll put this on here. And it says, what do I have to do? Oh, I just have to give it my GraphQL endpoint. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. I think it's right here. Okay, what else? Oh, I have to make sure that I import it, which I've done, because we all know that part of the spec is make sure you point to uh, the definition of this new tag. I've already done it, um, but here it is. Okay, that should be good. What's next here? Uh, GraphQL query, that sounds like what I want. Copy and paste here. Let me get rid of this for now. Okay, all right, now we're set up. So query starship, I don't want that query, I want this query here. Oh, yes, of course. All right, copy and paste here. All right, now let's see if that worked. Think that worked? Probably not, it's a light demo. Yeah, of course. Oh, okay, so let's see the console. There's no errors, but this doesn't look good. Uh, this is just printing what I put in there. I don't think that's supposed to do it. Oh, do you know why? It's a live demo. Because yeah. no, because the screw up. <laughs> this is all part of the script. Um, <laughs> The browser has no idea what that tag is. I never told it what a GraphQL dash query was. So if that <coughs> import isn't in there, it's just gonna be like, I have no idea. It's probably a div or something. So it's just gonna print the contents of it. Which, but, go ahead. I would say from an accessibility perspective, if the DOM doesn't know what a tag is, it just goes, you're a div. You're a div, I don't care. Yep. So like you've been able to write made up tags forever if you've noticed that you can <laughs> spell something, they just, they still work. So import that. Now if I refresh, the browser should know about that tag. And if I go to network, look at that. Made two GraphQL calls. Second one is my data. I have no idea how to do GraphQL. I saw a tutorial from Mateo from Lullabot and he's like, just go through here and put this in and it should work. And then I'm like, okay, well I'll go out to web components and see if I can find a tag. Oh, it's there, okay. All right, now we're, we're doing GraphQL now, Brian. Um, cool. Yeah. We're doing GraphQL well now. Um, so, uh, so that's that's one half of it. So, like, whenever Zane was talking about the the MathJax component, does anyone understand like how ridiculous it is that there's plugins for MathJax for all the different CMSs? Like, MathJax is nothing. It's a JavaScript library that has like a few settings. Why the hell would Drupal ever want to know about that? We should put all that stuff on the front end. That's what it's good for, right? So we can shove all that information into a single tag and just say, if you want to use MathJax, no matter what type of CMS or frame, framework you're on, just use the stamp tag. It knows what to do. So that's what we're going to try to do. That approach is a j sort of like a jailed in, locked in approach, right? Because eventually you're going to have to s stay within Drupal, right? Yeah. So yeah. When, when you're using, when you're leveraging your database in the whole Drupal system to make front end changes, you're locked in. Yep, so, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so 
there's there's in in our minds there's like there's there's some different there some different aspects to this. There's the uh, the functionality piece which we just showed you, where you can put some complex functionality, how to talk to different systems, how to uh, you know push different things to microservice, how to how to make your front end application know what GraphQL is and how to talk to it. But then it's also presentational, right? So we can turn things like Pattern Lab into presentational components that uh, that have variants and they have that they're smart. So um, what I mean by that is okay. So we were just we were just going over this uh, this Yuli here. I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat, but I'm just gonna so go straight cheat, to the end. You do that. So while he's cheating to do that, if you so he's wiring hard coding these lines in right to point to local host da 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 whatever, which you could do for a project, but you could also have a data binded variable to the address that that points to, and now you've got this encapsulated tag that you can feed into another system. So a lot of our integrations with Drupal involve boiling up to print a single tag on the interface and pass in a REST, a, a JSON endpoint, which then the data propagates down and makes that REST call on the front end to hook the whole thing up. So, okay, okay. go ahead. Um, <laughs> so naturally, like we, uh, even though I am a front end developer, I have really <laughs> stopped writing CSS and so I'm not good at it anymore. So I really rely on stuff like this. So I want to read, I, I want to print this out as a nice little card. Is there uh, a website in the past year that hasn't used a card? I think like 100% of the websites <coughs> use a card on the site. So uh, there's a paper card on Polymer, uh, on webcomponents.org. So I went to it said, okay, cool, that looks cool, I want that. Um, I uh, installed it, um, and I basically just copied and pasted this markup, and I created a new web component called VR App Tutorial. Now, the, remember, we're looping over tutorials, right? So what I want to do is I want to create a component that says any time that you present a uh, tutorial, it should be this, right? This is the same thing. If you're creating your front end um, in Pattern Lab, this is how you'd be structuring it. Um, the difference is um, that, so I put in my markup, and here, th this is where Pattern Lab would stop. It'd be like, okay, cool. This is uh, any time that you use me, um, I'm gonna look like this. But I don't really know, like, all the different variants and stuff just inherently. Like there has to be tooling and entire framework just around telling me what variants I have. With, with uh, uh, custom elements, however, web components, uh, we can actually tell it, okay, no, 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 you have a title and you have an author and you have an image and you have a summary and these are strings. And not only will you know about it, but the browser that, uh, that you reside on will also know about it, all right? So um, I create this, and so it's just going to render an image through a paper card and some other information. And then in my, in my app root here, I import that. So this is that, that import, that VR app tutorial. So I say, okay, browser, you now know about the, the tutorial, how I want to present that. I'm going to take all the information that was returned from GraphQL. I'm going to loop over it using Polymer and data binding uh, because it's, it's a lot nicer to do it that way. And I'm going to say, okay, um, you're expecting a title, I'm going to give you a title. You're expecting an author, I'm going to give you an author name. You're expecting an image, I'm going to give you this uh, tutorial, or yeah, tutorial thumbnail derivative URL, all right? So you, you should have all the information that you need to present your <coughs> right, And you got those from the GraphQL response that came back? You could go in and look at what those were called? Yep. Yep. So, if you look in your HTTP, uh, your your response here, um, it has all the entities here. So this was just a this is a, a post request, um, and you can preview the data that came back. And in here, you'll have your list of nodes, and then your uh, your information. The power with GraphQL is you can actually drill into entities right. or into references where REST right. you really so you can, but it's it. it's a little bit more uh, complicated. Uh, so now, if we refresh, it should render each one of these results through that new uh, that new component that we made, right? So voila. 
And we got an awesome explosion. <laughs> and an awesome explosion. So. so this is the development workflow. I, and now I get into meetings with people who are like, should we use React? Or what? I'm like, no, this isn't an option. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, this is, it's, in, it's stupid how fast we can develop things this way. So, Mike, how long have you uh, known GraphQL? It's on there. We'll have lots of, we're actually, we're going to have a boff after this about just headless development. If we want to get in the weeds a little bit more or just debate other frameworks. So, that had not, that was an awesome detour, right? But it had literally nothing to do with what Zane said. So, let's stitch the two together. Mike just, every bit of knowledge he just showed you, he developed in like two days, right? So we're starting to develop things in like minutes and hours because the, these knowledge bases stack. If you can make a really kick-ass button, you're never making a button again. Anyway, right? If you make the button the right way, we need a button. If I make a card the right way, I don't need a card. And so we're just able to keep repurposing from each other. Um, there's 1,400 elements on webcomponents.org. And a heck of a lot of them are really extensible and easy to pick up and actually do something relevant with. So, when did we first deploy some web components into production, Potter? Is it this summer? Uh, it was late, late spring. Late spring. So late spring, we started to move some in. And so this starts to get into how do we migrate, how, right? Because I, I love everybody in Drupal 8 land, but uh, there's a million people in Drupal 7, literally. And they're not moving, a lot of them because it's really expensive to move. Mm -hmm. And it's because you have to learn Twig, and you have to learn this, and this part of the tooling, and then this changes. And instead of blowing those people off and being like, just pay a lot of money, this is the pathway towards that. If you start <laughs> deconstructing your Drupal sites in place, six, seven, whatever, other systems, you're unlocking gateways, right? So when I don't have the noodly function that puts a tooltip on everything, .js, in Drupal 6 module that I need to import that for no reason, and it's instead embedded in my front end assets, that's an upgrade path that's unlocked. And so we've already disabled 20 to 40 Drupal modules in our seven stacks since moving to this approach. I deleted 100,000 lines of front end code in the migration to this. Just because I deleted SAS. We don't need SAS anymore, okay? <laughs> Not that you can't use it, the assets, the, the elements themselves are already scoped. What were you using SAS and BAM and all these techniques for? It was to fudge your way around scoping a class name to be 100 miles long so it would target that one card in that one time. You don't have to do that anymore. So what about authoring experience? Because this is what we're actually after. So here's your link, John, that I've been withholding. If you go to haxtheweb.org, you can play with this now. You're not going to crash any server unless you take down GitHub. Um, this is a fully decoupled authoring solution that is running in the browser. It's not talking to anything other than a, a JSON file, basically. Um, but we are trying to get all of the authoring out of Drupal. So if you imagine, if we use this technology concept of being able to build these elements up and up and up and up, and we used it to destroy CK Editor. Because every solution that Zane mentioned was always predicated on CK Editor. That is the root of all evil. Every talk that man has done with me since the beginning of time has been about the battle for the body field and this is where ran, this is where absolute chaos is. And oh, we'll use the token module and the token module will talk to this one. So none of the problems should be solved there. They are all awesome solutions, but they're under a faulty premise of, well, and then they'll use a wizard. Yeah, and then they'll just dump it in the wizard. Yeah, and then they'll just copy and paste. Like, you've, you've seeded that ground. You're losing already because they have to use the wizard. Like, that is the real problem. So, what is Hacks? Hacks is short for Headless Authoring Experience with the head on. So, some concepts in Hacks other than Legos. <laughs> so, there's gizmos. We refer to gizmos as the visual asset that a, a content contributor is going to put on the page. The thing they're going to click, the area on the interface they're going to go to and say, that's the thing I want. We need a selection interface for that. And we can't just use the word web component because developer, to, we're going to have too many people talking about things as web components. I just need a web component that does, okay, do you? I don't know what you're referring to. So we needed a different word. But effectively, a gizmo is just a web component that, ex that fires this one function up. And so what that looks like is we take any visual asset and we add on this part. 
to it in its, its attached life cycle. So when it attaches to the DOM, we say, oh, well, you're not just video hyphen player. I'm a video player. And if you are to present me, I should be the color red, and you should use an icon that looks like I'm a, a video. Then we have handlers who say, well, I'm able to handle videos. And if you have a source, that maps to my source property. If you have a title, map that to my caption. If you have a color, map that to my primary color. And so we're, buying, we're teaching some other spec, which we'll get to in a second, how to talk to this web component via this little JSON. Then we have form fields. And so one of the biggest problems with if we are going to get decoupled completely is, crap, Drupal is really stinking good at forms. Their form array hell is one thing, but it's still incredible compared to any other system you're going to go to. The amount of flexibility, how easy it is to add stuff to it, the auto-validation. How do we get out of that? So we have our own little schema here that we then map to something called JSON schema. If you haven't seen JSON schema, I highly recommend checking it out. It's basically the way to translate JSON into, like, conveying meaning of, like, well, what is that field to do that input? I feel like there's a web component for that. <laughs> so if you search for something called JSON schema on webcomponents.org, I think it saved us four months of development by itself. You pass in JSON schema, so you would say, this is a title, and it is a string. And then it binds to another value, here's the form field for that. And it binds to another value, here's the values being typed in for that. So if you pass in JSON schema, you will get your authenticated, or sorry, your, your validated form with all the inputs, and you can leverage other web components to produce the output of those even. So we can have a single tag that builds our, front, our forms on the front end. If we can get Drupal or other systems to deliver JSON schema, which is an actual standard, and we already all talk in JSON, and we output <coughs> things in JSON pretty much anyway. So another concept, App Store. So Hacks is seeking to pull in the universe to itself and then run it through visual com uh, components and put it on the screen. So the Hacks App Store, if you're playing with it there, yeah, and you're, you're reading the site, you can click the power button and then there's a thing that says rich content and then you can hit find something. These apps in the app store are that the world is a content bucket. And so if you want to search YouTube, why are we sending people to YouTube? Why are we doing Drupal integrations with YouTube? Why are we doing entity video field XYZ to YouTube? It's freaking YouTube. It's a single link. Because we were under the assumption that we had to boil that universe back to get it to a token to put it into a WYSIWYG field. And if we can collapse that paradigm, we can just reach out and talk to YouTube. Right? I have a link, I talk to YouTube, I can query YouTube in the front end, much like he did GraphQL, I can do directly to YouTube's API from the front end, pass it into a list of selectable cards, which I already had a visual asset for, so I didn't develop, click, bubble up an event, and go, hey, what gizmos do we have that can present a video from YouTube? And so if we can do that, the apps saying, hey, I have videos, and that video is YouTube link ID, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter if it's YouTube. So authoring new integration points for this is like three minutes, five minutes. Do you have an API? Do you know what the structure of it is? Can you authenticate to it? Yes? Cool. It's an app now. So we just have a JSON object that's expressing what this is, how to browse it, um, what a preview should look like, uh, what it supplies, whether it's a video or image, and then what that supplies from there to you know a visual asset. And so that looks like a YouTube integration. Literally looks like a lot of JSON that says, hey, I'm YouTube, and I should be read, and you should visualize me this way, and here's the API endpoint. And to browse me, you're going to do a get request, again, slash search, and then the search term is going to be Q. And so this search aspect right here, that Q is going to update the URL to put the Q equals whatever. This is JSON schema. So these three lines will generate a form. So I can add whatever fields I want to to the front end by just modifying this little section. So the data piece is then the additional parts of the URL. And then, hey, when you get results back, if someone's previewing it, this is where the title is. This is where the description is. This is where an image is. And then if someone selects one of those, this is where the title is, this is where the description is, this is where the caption and citation and video ID and the link to the thing are. And so instead of talking through 
that stuff more. If you go to hackstheweb.org, you can see what we're talking about. So this is hacks, and I made, of course, a picture of the world because the world is epic. And so you can. This is actually a little mini doc site. You can read about what this does. But Jonah Hill loves it. He's going nuts about it. So how did I get Jonah Hill in there? Okay, Jonah Hill. I went and hit edit. I hit rich media. Now, if I have a link to something, I can just dump it in. So if you already, you know, if you're in that, someone knew how to do copy and paste, they can copy and paste in this field, and this field will attempt to figure out how to render that. So let's do find something. Uh, I want Jonah Hill. So I'm going to go to Jiffy. I'm going to search for Happy Dance. Okay, I'm going to pull that. Hacks is going to say from the gizmo, right? So I had my I have my visual assets on one side, and they're saying I'm a gizmo. I provide an image, or I'm a gizmo. I provide a video. Well, this side, the data source of Jiffy said, I have images. And I selected one. And it goes, hey, hacks, I have an image. Who can render me? And three things put their hands up and say, oh, no, I know how to render that. So hacks presents this middle UI layer. All of the tags in this, all of the sources in this are completely pluggable. So my visual assets were visual. We were making a video player. And then we started to work on this idea and said, if I copy and paste this one aspect into that tag, now it works with hacks. So I'm going to do that in a second and show a, an asset from webcomponents.org that I have basically copy and pasted four lines into, and now I have an authoring system. So I want to present this accessibly. So selecting that, there's that wiring between the source of the data and the visual output of the data, pre-populating the fields. This form is generated by JSON schema. So if I need to modify that form, I'm updating a few field values, and now I have a form that's validated appropriately. If I hit GIF, I can see it playing. Uh, I don't want that to be dance. Dance like, I mean it. All right, insert. Now I've got that GIF in my page. Um, if I wanted to take Jonah Hill and select Jonah Hill, now Jonah Hill's already been made. So what's, what is it I'm selecting? That's custom element. So that's A11Y hyphen GIF hyphen player. If there's an accessibility issue, I have the accountability to know where that is. Basically what Hacks is doing is all the stuff us as developers could have typed manually, leveraging component architecture to be able to type less, and then wires it all together. So I could take that GIF and go, all right, I know to target things within this body area, right, if this is my WYSIWYG replacement, and go, oh, I want to edit Jonah Hill. And it takes those values, regraphs them back into that form that pops up, knowing how to communicate change to that field. So if I wanted to you know, screw it up, then I can screw it up, insert it back in the DOM, hit save. If I hit export, this is everything I just wrote. So this is the HTML that's living there that I authored by just clicking through. And if I hit download, this is that file, but it's not on hackstheweb.org now. It's on my computer. So we are simultaneously, because of web components, we are simultaneously building a desktop application that uses every single asset our front-end websites will use. We can progressively collapse into this approach because we're using the same technology to build those components, right? To build a video player or to build a incredible, uh, you do chemistry animations. He's doing some really complex chemistry animations where you click and like molecules move around but it's a single tag, but we teach hacks how to talk to that single tag, and now I can author chemical equations in the browser. And then I can reference that HTML import and render that chemical equation anywhere. It doesn't have to be Drupal. It doesn't have to be a CMS for that matter. It could be a desktop app. So some of the other ones that are in there, uh, NASA, everybody likes the moon, right? The moon's pretty stinking epic. We do cover image from the moon. Delete these things in place. You know, let, let's update that icon. Right, so this is a JSON schema form. Again, just pointing to, uh, that's called a, an iron icon, and telling the icon field, hey, your data bound to this value, flip. So you can start to do stupidly impressive things at times with almost no effort because all of the knowledge just keeps stacking on top of itself. We fix one problem, and that one problem might be rent outputting a form. Now, or sorry, outputting an input value. Every input field that we stamp onto the page, in this case, is, hey, there's an input. It's got the 
accessibility stuff automatically guaranteed because it's a paper input. And paper inputs by Google. So that's the other little, <coughs> oh, Google makes Polymer. These elements are going to start to show up in every application you see on the web, gang. <laughs> They're showing up in Chrome. There are interfaces in Chrome that if you go into the settings and you right click and hit view source in Chrome, which is weird to, in the settings panel, you will start to see paper tags and other tags. So Google got sick of having to solve this problem for themselves and release these assets. So the paper hyphen whatevers are pretty stinking accessible already because they were made by crazy big company that rolled out the new version of YouTube in this. Did anyone know YouTube is now using web components? They, they made a big deal about it, but like still no one really seemed to know what that meant. <laughs> but if you go to YouTube and you right click, you can see that there's like YTD video hyphen history, right? So then like the entire history asset that's doing the, the headless call and loading in your videos is one tag. Now they want to put that in any other system, copy, paste, reference the import, not rebuild because, oh, it happens to be in Google Docs or, oh, it happens to be in this other system. So, so just, just to be clear, uh, am I looking at something that's being driven from a back end? This, no. This is completely running in the browser, other than the data sources, obviously. So the data sources are going out to YouTube and querying YouTube, which inspect and view network. And then, oh, man, official trailer. Uh, let's pick a different video instead. Maybe they need to actually search. That would help. In. There we go. So there's the response going out the door. And then our app, our app store spec, if you will, has hit this and been like, well, if you're talking to YouTube, this is how you remap. We're basically taking those APIs and then um, repointing them into what will make this preview card. So we can point anything and route it into this preview card data. Um, if it was like Unsplash, which is a different search engine, or Sketchfab, maybe I want um, a monster. All right, so we'll put a monster in. So now I'm embedding a 3D monster in here. Um, there's also some examples on the page of like a duck, which, yeah, you can edit text. That immediately becomes a question. So like if I want to duplicate these paragraphs of text, I can do that. Or if I wanted to take this paragraph, this code view, and make it normal text or what have you, you can still do those type of wizzy wiggy things. Um, but if I, if I just want to make something, right, maybe I don't have a source for it, I just have the file. Take a 3D player element, I'm gonna paste in my duck. All right. One, two, there we go. So this is an AR, AR in the browser. Granted, I didn't make the 3D duck there, right? I, <laughs> give, let's skip a bit to say I can't just author AR in the browser, although Potter's working on that. So um, I got that integrated there. That's from A-Frame. You know, my users could have a duck that they could put on their cardboard glasses and look around. How many Drupal modules is that right now? <laughs> that that tag took us an afternoon to make because we the, the the knowledge stacks. Hey, how do I want to do this? Oh, I did that before. Sweet, this design pattern. Like we're copying pasting a ton in these things. So I'm going to I'm going to add a new one to this, um, which will in part illustrate why we adopted Polymer. Um, you, there are other frameworks for manufacturing web components. They are very good. In fact, we might start using what the heck's the one I'm, I really love? Vue.js? No, not Vue.js. <laughs> <laughs> Jerk. Um, no, I, it'll come. Stencil. Stencil. Stencil JS, which um, might actually be really appealing to people currently working in React, just because it uses JSX template. It uses a lot of the same conventions, um, but then you run a command and it takes that stuff and compiles it down to a vanilla web component. Vanilla web component in this definition being to the spec itself. Polymer is almost your equivalent of like a jQuery where there's a bunch of helper functions that just make certain conventions a lot easier. There's some argument in the community, is that necessary, you know, I want this to be as fast as possible. You're ultimately gonna end up writing stuff to do a lot of the things Polymer's doing anyway, like data binding. Because the browser doesn't do data binding, it needs some help to do that in the first place. So this right here, which we didn't even cover before, um, is the number is the number one reason to use Polymer in my opinion. It, come, it has a Polymer CLI. I can run Polymer serve or Polymer init to get these elements started. As I write the element, the, the API updates. So that 
API documentation that Mike was showing before, those sites just build themselves. You edit the properties and it'll update the properties in this little site. So we've, we went from being at this event last year with no stake in the game and not really knowing what to do with this, to now we have 124 repos on a separate organization called LRN Web Components, all of which are webcomponents.org <coughs> capable, most of which are actual elements. I'll say there's probably four repos that are like meta types of things, um, like the Hacks desktop app because now the desktop becomes a viable target when I don't really have to do any additional work to get there. Um, so Polymer CLI launched my little mini site. So now, oops, I'm running hack, uh, a local copy of Hacks, which we saw was out there before. I'm going to Rich Media, Gizmo, um, Audio Player. So again, much like Potter, I'm cheating a little bit. I went to webcomponents.org and I searched for something called Wave Player. We were having a conversation two days ago, and he was like, the guy was saying, oh, okay, I really want to do things in this approach. Um, I have this, this audio player that we use in our content, and, it's, and he's describing it. It's, it's called wavesurfer.js. If you've seen it, it, it takes the file, analyzes it, and it makes this little visual where you can see the peaks and valleys of the sound form. And as he's talking, I'm searching on webcomponents.org for the name of the thing that he's describing. I find this component. I'm like, oh, you mean this? And there's the webcomponents.org. And, you know, it loads and then... So that whole thing, granted, it's referencing a JavaScript library internal to itself. It's not magic <laughs> entirely, but um, to integrate that into platforms is a single tag. I can look at the API and I can see, copy and paste that in. So I said, I want to wire that up to hacks. Because hacks should be invisible, basically. So, much like Mike was saying before, to wire this up to hacks, I imported a reference to what are called behaviors. Behaviors allow you to have kind of bits of an element that you can sprinkle into another one. And so we have a behavior to make things work with hacks which basically just provides common, common functions that you can call and stuff. But because it's just an event bubbling up in the DOM, it, you don't have to use Polymer to engineer these, is, is the, the main point. So I, I import those behaviors, and I go into the element, and it looks like, hey, look, they're leveraging paper icon buttons. So now there's design and UX and accessibility consistency even throughout this crazy wave playing element. Scroll down, they have more classes, more classes, probably too many classes. Um, get into the button and the way it works. Okay, so I can implement those behaviors or import them to my element right here. And I say cool behaviors, hacks property behaviors. And you see their element is well documented, has things like cover art, wave surfer. So I create an attached hook and I say, hey, when you're in hacks, you're able to be scaled, you can be positioned, you should show up as something called an audio player. And instead, we're going to make this purple instead of red. Uh, then you can handle audio and the source tag coming from a source. You should put in your SRC, title to title, caption to subtitle. When you're presented in quick form, you should just show the link. And when you're on a configuration page, you should show the source and a title. And so by saying those things and adding nothing else, it's a, then there's one other thing that says this dot set hacks properties and that object, which handles all the firing the event to be listened to. Laying the tag on the page, it will now register with hacks and show up here. So now I have that waveform audio player. But I need content for it. So um, we can hit CC Mixer, which is open source Creative Commons music. And then Hacks goes, oh, there's two things that claim they can do audio. Which one do you want to do? Audio player. It's called strand insert. And now it's there. Boom! So it was, it takes, it, it's honestly, it, it takes longer to have the meetings about what it, things should be named than to develop this way once you start down the path because just to clarify, so you show all the code there to integrate a web component into apps so that you can use it generically everywhere all the time. Correct. Right. Yeah. And how long did it take you to write that? 
to write which? That configuration file, like to, to integrate the web component into hacks. I copy and paste it from other ones I made, so like two minutes. <laughs> but it's a visual <laughs> asset, right? So like now whenever someone on our team says, uh, our content contributors, I need a way to present content that looks like a note card because I just really need people to think, you know, like it's a note, like a sticky note they want to leave to them. Right, I can make something that does just that one stupid thing. Wired up to hacks in a matter of seconds. Use drop shadow and other design consistency things from the Polymer or the Web Components community. Insert that. However, I can build that entire thing in a vacuum. So I build that out as a standalone asset. We have all of our assets side by side with one another, which that one's called LRN Design Block Quote. And I can Polymer serve on Block Quote and I can build out the documentation of what that block quote is, how it should function, communicate that with the rest of the team. I can get into what the methods are, what behaviors it leverages, and go over and see the demo, which I don't have the assets pulled in for. You have to run Bower install, and I want to do that on the Wi-Fi. But so I can have all these mini documentation sites build out that visual asset completely independent of hacks, get their approval, put it into a few front ends because it's just an import, and hard coded into a template file. That's the other part of this. We're in part of this stage collapse of Drupal 7. We're rewriting all of our template file output because we're on D7 for a lot of it, right? Our TPLs used to be div, 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 garbage, 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 CSS. Now it's like paper hyphen card, put the, the PHP into these fields. Um, Sam, I can't, Morrison, I can't Mortensen. remember. Mortensen. Mortensen uh, is working on a twig to. Uh, a twig binding to a uh, web component type of a thing so that you could just do that auto wiring. Um, there's also, there's modules for Drupal, right? it's not entirely screw Drupal. Um, so there's a hacks module for D7 and D D6, it needs ported. Um, what these integrations are doing is basically just creating an edit tab and then loading that on and sticking the node's body field into one of these. Um, there's also the web components module, which has stable six and seven releases and some uh, development work in eight. And what that's doing is a whole ton of other stuff that we didn't even bother to talk about today, which is um, we, we will read off the assets, your, your web component assets, and automatically generate entities off of that. And then those, en or sorry, entities and display modes. And so your node, you can start to fire through one of these web components by using the field UI to map it up or to use display suite and then output it through views. So then you go to views and you say, hey, output is this display mode. And that display mode is told to is actually a web component. So all Drupal's doing is ripping the fields into those little properties in a single tag in a single TPL file and spitting it into the DOM. DOM unpacks and it knows everything else. So that was our first you know, foray into the web components that's actually what we worked on here last year was like, hey, we need a progressive collapse strategy. And that started to become it is we don't have views TPL files. We still use views in the interim, but I'd much rather have some awesome jQuery or some <laughs> JSON or GraphQL or anything else. Um, <coughs> but um, yeah, so we, I've also ported this to Backdrop and to um, Grav CMS as two additional targets and then there's a bunch of videos and study find online of like making an asset once and using it in five different CMSs simultaneously um, if you need to convince people. These so, also play perfectly nice with other technologies. We are, uh, we are at time. We're at time. We had a question though. Um, you have a question? No, I'm just so so we, are, we are at time. We are going to do a boff in I think it's probably next door on just headless development if anyone wants to talk more. But thanks for coming by today. So TLDR, uh, start using web components. You don't have to go fully decoupled. You can start using web components for just simple, solving simple problems. Um, just start looking into them because they are the future. So.